Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, and I most definitely have some shenanigans of cosmic proportions for you this week. Uh, we are going to be talking about the graphic novel Neonomicon, written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Jason Burroughs. It was published by Avatar Press in 2011. I'm pretty sure it's 2011. And it collects two stories, The Courtyard and Neonomicon. Now, I want to preface this by saying I don't have a lot of experience regarding comic books and graphic novels, but I'd like to expand, as I've mentioned on the show before, into all forms of media where cosmic horror has an influence, and graphic novels most definitely uh, is one of those areas. So I apologize if some of the technical aspects of comic book graphic novelness isn't exactly accurate, but here we go. Now, previously... On an episode of Cosmic Shenanigans, we talked about the book I Am Providence and about this combination of fiction and metafiction happening in the story. That happens in these stories, too. And it's really kind of a neat idea. The concept is that while Lovecraft's and Robert Chambers and Clark Ashton Smith's work, all, like all those guys... While it exists in literature and pop culture, the idea is that Lovecraft and, by extension, these other writers actually base their work on real things, a real religion, real entities from beyond the edges of the universe, uh, real occult magic. There are abundant references to not only many of Lovecraft's fictional stories. If you are a Lovecraft fan, there are countless references, which will give you glee. Uh, there's references to elements of his stories, creations of his. But there's also references to real-world magical systems, which are based on belief in Lovecraft's pantheon and magic ritual. And again, in the prior episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans, we talked about that, how the idea of many aspects of modern occult magic is based on uh, the idea that a lot of Lovecraft's magic, for lack of a better word, works in magical systems. It works for people. So there are references to that. Uh, in this graphic novel, which I believe is set a little bit in the future, Lovecraft's work pervades society. It's in music, especially. It's in literature. It's in movies. It's even in the geography, because the courtyard takes place, for the most part, in a subset of Brooklyn called Red Hook, which people are often familiar with and often remember because it's one of Lovecraft's more racist stories. In this particular story, uh, Red Hook is shown to be a pri primarily non-white ghetto, uh, more or less. It's, But Lovecraft's work, it pervades every aspect of subculture, including porn. And we're going to come back to that. Now, the major difference here is that a lot of cosmic horror, or at least a lot of traditional cosmic horror, it just suggests. Lovecraft hints, but more in Burroughs show it graphically. Where there's a whisper in Lovecraft's work, in this graphic novel, it's a shout. But it works. Where you find subtlety in these stories is more in the sense of humor. Uh, at times, there's sort of a metafictional humor, like one of the characters mentions that it, it, it almost feels like they're part of some literary in-joke. And there's this brilliant repurposing of Lovecraft's most famous elements in this modern or postmodern urban setting. Now, to tackle the racism issue, clearly, because racism was such a problem, it was problematic for a lot of people as far as Lovecraft's personality, and it did invade his work in many ways. Now, we've argued before that the racism aspect of, of Lovecraft's character probably works f for the work as opposed to against it in that I'm not so sure he could have created a sense of alienness, a sense of fear of the other without genuinely being afraid of the other. Uh, that is not to say that it excuses this racism. racism. And what, what Moore does to, to acknowledge that, I think, is that 
he addresses the inherent racism by having the main character of the courtyard, who we come to find out is Aldo Sachs, as a brilliant FBI agent who essentially invented anomaly theory, and we'll come back to discussing that. But otherwise, this guy is a racist asshole. He is not a likable character at all. Uh, Other than the fact that he seems to have this one skill uh, that the FBI finds absolutely indispensable. Moore doesn't shy away from this uh, unpleasant aspect of Sax's character either. Rather, it's It is the characteristic that separates the agent from the people around him. It makes him the outsider inside, so to speak, because he's undercover in Red Hook, investigating a series of connected and extremely bizarre and gruesome murders. But like so many of Lovecraft's protagonists, Sax is a man in a world he doesn't care for and doesn't understand. It's a world he feels he's above, that he's moved beyond, when in some ways the world has moved beyond him. Uh, Further, he's a protagonist in search of hidden and forbidden knowledge, the discovery of which, which is uh, something in the graphic novel called Aklo, forever changes him. It introduces what some might call madness and what others would maybe call enlightenment, but at a terrible price. Sachs is the essential Lovecraft protagonist, which, as Lovecraft often did himself, does not necessarily mean the story's hero. Now, a quick note on anomaly theory. I I love this idea. Moore creates here the fundamental underlying principle behind any of modern cosmic horror's occult detectives. And this is the idea that Sachs has a unique ability to correlate the contents of the strangest and least fitting aspects of cases and thus solve them. It's a perfect micro element, if you will, that is reflective of the bigger picture of cosmic horror or of supernatural horror in general, that when we finally put together the pieces of strange, when we finally discover the way those pieces really fit in the grand cosmic scheme of things, the picture we see is terrifying beyond words. It is a mind altering, often body altering experience. And that's, that's what he does in this is that he, he follows the anomaly theory. Now, we can't really talk about a graphic novel without commenting on the visuals because I believe that comics and graphic novels are as much a visual medium as they are a written medium. And I'd also go venture to say that their visuals matter nearly as much as they do in movies or video games. The art is absolutely important. And Burroughs renders every page in loving detail, telling much of the story, I think, in the art itself. His cosmic horror panels of other worlds and newly tapped vistas of thought are absolutely breathtaking. His sexual panels are terrifying and and probably very inappropriately titillating, maybe. Uh, But the devil is most certainly in his details. When Breers, one of the main characters in Neonomicon, experiences horrors through blurry vision because she had to remove her contacts, we get a true sense of helplessness in the blurry rendering of the panels. We see so much of the city's grime and filth and corruption in the city streets in the little things like like hypodermic needles in the alleyways and things like that. So much of the people Sachs scorns as degenerates are like in the outer edges of the pages just living, just surviving the nightlife. And I think it's it's really very brilliantly done that he captures an atmosphere uh, in almost the, the side art, as opposed to the main panels, which are telling the stories. And it, it is really, really very beautifully done. There are cosmic horror jokes in the porn titles, which are almost barely even legible, on uh, barely legible on these shop shelves. Every detail, I feel was planned, and surprisingly, every detail forwards both the theme and the story. So I, I would definitely say I'm, I'm a fan of, of this combination of, of Moore and Burroughs doing work together because it's, it's beautifully plotted, beautifully planned out. Now, you can't talk about Neonomicon or, or this collection of stories in general without really tackling the idea of sex. Now, we've discussed in a prior episode of Cosmic Shenanigans the notion that in cosmic horror... There is a, an, an underlying body horror in a lot of it that people wouldn't expect because they think of it as sort of a quiet horror thing. But there's a clay-like aspect of the human body. Uh, there's the extent of deconstruction 
that often happens on a physical level in order to make people more like the old ones, free of the restraints of a single solid physical form. However, being single solid physical beings, humans are often mutilated in this process in the most horrific ways, a kind of underflavor of body horror, as I mentioned, that pairs with cosmic horror's strongest themes. This is a tradition which extends back to Lovecraft's The Thing on the Doorstep, The Color Out of Space, The Whisperer in Darkness, among others. And we see it in Cosmic Horror, which predates Lovecraft, too, as well as the work of his contemporaries. Mutilation is all over this graphic novel. Uh, it is the M.O. of the serial killer or killers that really gets the story ignited, that whoever's killing these people is cutting off their hands and their heads and essentially opening up the, the torsos of their bodies like stars. Uh, one of the characters references that they're carved up like tulips. And it's pretty graphic. What we don't often see in traditional cosmic horror is graphic depictions of sex. Now, that is not to say that there is no sex. It's there but it's not presented quite the same way. On the subject of Lovecraft's work, many experts argue that Lovecraft, being an asexual being by all accounts, did not include sex in his stories, that anybody who sees it there is looking too hard for it. He neither understood it nor was comfortable with it. Now, others claim Lovecraft's work is rife with subtle suggestion of the most deviant and disturbing sexuality. And honestly... For me personally, I think the truth is actually a combination of both. I don't think Lovecraft intended anything overtly sexual in his stories. Not, not in a titillating sort of way. But it's there all the same, and it's pretty horrific. Mostly, it takes the form of the invasion of the body, which extends to rape. Uh, there's unwilling impregnation, uh, interspecies breeding. There's rape of the mind. Uh, all of that factors into a number of his stories. Now, the impact that these actions have on women is utterly glossed over, and that's one of the flaws, I think, of Lovecraft's writing. But the invasion of men's minds and bodies is dramatically felt. And you can let that say what it will about Lovecraft, but I suspect that it was his attempt at understanding the horror of unwilling invasion of body and mind, the horror of loss of bodily control, and perhaps by subconscious extension, rape, from the only gender he truly understood. I don't think it's that he meant to minimize it for women. I think he just didn't understand it, so he tackled it in a way that he did. That's all good. Now, there's no question about sex in this graphic novel, though. Uh, the main heroine of the story such as she is, uh, is a former sex addict with self-esteem issues who is assigned to pick up the case where sex leaves off and finds the strongest lead in a sex and porno trade angle. Now, this results in her unwilling participation at gunpoint in an orgy and three days of rape at the hands of a deep one graphically displayed on the pages. Now, Moore gets around a great deal of the psychological aftermath effectively by acknowledging that the experience changed her, but in a way she did not expect. Uh, she is essentially, like in many cosmic horror stories, a chosen vessel, like Lavinia Waitley, let's say. Um, what we see, though, is not, in my opinion, the same kind of glossing over of the psychological scarring in the aftermath of really gratuitous like uh, gratuitous sexual assault of a woman who spends most of her time in the story naked and vulnerable and afraid. It's not for sick guffaws that she was a sex addict. You know, it's not that he's reducing women to that. On the contrary, what we see is someone struggling with her sense of self, with her belief in her own insignificance in the world, which is a cosmic horror you know, recurring theme, um, with her pointless existence and her uselessness. And instead of the cosmic horror reaffirming that, after this experience, which should have broken her completely, we see instead a kind of empowerment. We see her claim something of a, a goddess status, a mother goddess role, in the future recreation of the universe. We see the insult of men using her body is left behind. 
Her body and any dirty physical and psychological drawbacks of wanton sex no longer have power over her. She's transcended these things because in being impregnated, she finds vistas of untapped knowledge about the universe and a kind of power within herself. Like so many outsiders becoming insiders, another recurring theme in a lot of cosmic horror, particularly in Lovecraft's work, she has been respected, accepted, anointed even, and bestowed with great power, and she embraces it, as many of Lovecraft's otherwise doomed heroes do. She learns, and this is absolutely the cosmic aspect of this cosmic horror, that the right words, and Lovecraft did this often with spells, can allow control of and manipulation of time because past, present, and future are all one, interchangeable and malleable, and space. She can, she can access endless worlds to, to travel between and to communicate uh, with ancient gods. She can traverse the difference between reality and dream, uh, if there even is a difference at all. Like I said, there's a transcendence, there's a change beginning, and kind of a neat concept, I think, that the ancient gods aren't ancient, but new, that they're unborn gods, and that we think of as the past is really the future, that we are inexorably heading toward that future. And that's that's what I think is fascinating about this, is that he, he takes a lot of tropes of cosmic horror, and he repurposes them in this in this brilliant way for for a modern age um it is it is graphic it is brutal it is blunt but it is absolutely cosmic horror in in all its all its glory it is absolutely beautiful in that way uh definitely worth checking out uh i read it in i think maybe i'm not a terribly fast reader but i i read it in a super short amount of time particularly for me uh and i definitely think it's 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 worth checking out it's an incredible graphic novel. Now, we also have from Brian Fata Steele, the author of There is Darkness in Every Room, a new book, Your Arms Around Entropy and Other Stories. There is darkness everywhere. It lingers in wait under your bed and fills the void of space. Whispers that trickle into your mind when you're vulnerable and a mass that stirs in the deeper black that cannot ever possibly be understood. Tales of divergent worlds, see I'm already sold, but all enveloped by forces more powerful than any nightmare. A teenage girl staying with her grandparents for the summer discovers the abandoned shack on the property still has a terrifying purpose. With a small portion of America infected with an alien organism, a government envoy is sent in to parlay. A music journalist investigating a rock band influenced by H.P. Lovecraft stumbles into a far more harrowing harrowing underground scene. What appear to be millions of mimes, woohoo, I love mimes, roam the streets, killing people or worse. A necromancer's protege wonders how much more death can be summoned before there's a breaking point. In a world now filled with monsters, a young woman is slowly dying one day at a time. See, this, this already sounds incredible. Twelve tales of cosmic horror and Lovecraftian nihilism. Stories where you have accepted the darkness, dove into the abyss, swallowed down the chaos. Stories where you've wrapped your arms around entropy. Steele infuses the tales with a gleeful, no-holds-barred imagination that dares you to turn the page and see what creatures and mad events wait. That's a quote from John Claude Smith, a Bram Stoker Award-nominated author of Occasional Beasts. Tales and Riding the Centipede. I'm sorry, that's Occasional Beast, Tales and Riding the Centipede. Your Arms Around Entropy, now available on Kindle ebook for 99 cents and soon in paperback. And that's it for this week, folks. If you enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans, you might also enjoy another show I co-host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Both of them are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Also, thanks as always to engineer Dave Thomas. Watch his channel most nights at twitch.tv slash meteornotes. And I will see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Every person's story has something to teach us. How others view life. How obstacles are overcome. How joy is felt. 
how fears are faced, how love is expressed. The Matters of Faith podcast explores individual stories of people's lives and how faith plays a part. It may not be your story, but it may help shape yours. The Matters of Faith podcast with Jay Wilburn is on Project Entertainment Network.